So what I want to talk about, and it's not just for today's lecture, um, it's going to be basically for the next three lectures. So we know what the plants are, we know about seed banks, okay, we know the weeds are competitive, how are they competitive, in what way, what are they competing for, okay, and how do we measure competition? You know, what do we do? So hopefully in the next three lectures you're going to get a good sense of why it is that sometimes when you're fertilizing your fields, your crops, I often tell growers, you're probably fertilizing the weeds more than you're fertilizing your crops. I want you to be able, after these three lectures, to think about critically your fertility management strategies, okay? And whether you're, it's the right approach or not, and, and the kind of fertilizers you're using and so forth. And so now this is going to be starting to pull things together. So what I'll talk about is factors that are typically competed for. Most of you would know, but I want to give you some more details. We'll talk about inter-specific inter competition, okay? How the plants adapt to competition. Again, weeds are fantastic at doing this, much better than our crops, okay? Timing is everything, timing of emergence, okay? And this ties into your fertility management, okay? And we'll talk about the critical period of weed competition, okay? There's gonna be a critical time when a grower must get in there and manage his or her weeds, otherwise there's gonna be major yield reductions. That is known as the critical period, and I'll show you how you calculate that. It's not easy, but you can actually calculate it for various crops, okay, in and, and, and given situations. And then I'll show you a couple of ways that we can measure competition, okay? So before starting, the question I have for you is, kind of getting into this, what's the difference between interference and competition? If somebody says, you know, weeds interfere with crops, and somebody says, weeds compete, with crops. What's the difference? Rob? Right. Okay. Right. So kind of what, what the com competition for nutrients or water would be what we call a direct, direct impact, okay, versus kind of an indirect impact, which might be, you know, getting in the way of a har harvesting equipment and so forth, or spoilage of some sort. But there's another component of interference. You've got competition. So interference is a broader term that incorporates competition for resources, whether they're direct pulling out the nutrients or indirect, but what's the other component? A little pathy. Yeah. You might have, you know, this is, so a little pathy, which is of course the release of chemicals that inhibit growth or germination of a species, okay? So black grass often, or, or a lot of you know but black walnut, releases juglone, which inhibits the growth of other plants around. So that is, the plant is not necessarily competing directly for nutrients, it's inhibiting the growth of the other species. So Competition and a little pathy put together refer to interference. Interference is the broader term. So the reason I'm saying that is be careful when, you know, you're really meaning to say this is competition and you really mean that it's, you know, the plant is competing or the weed is competing for nutrients, water, okay, or light, ra rather than maybe an interference indirect effect like getting, you know, clogging up your combine or having a little pathy. Okay, it's just terminology, but it's important for you to be aware. So the broader term is interference. Specifically, though, I'm not going to talk about a little pathy. I'm focusing on competition for resources. Okay? So when do you have competition? When, when do weeds compete for, for, for resources? What are, what's a situation where you have, how do you know you have competition? You just, the, there's a weed there automatically, that's competition? Exactly, exactly. And that's what Donald was an agronomist, well-known agronomist. And his quote was that competition occurs, uh, and you have that, okay, when each of two organisms seek, seek the measure they want of any particular factor or thing. When the immediate supply of that factor or thing is below the combined demand of the organisms. Simply put, it's what Eric said, when you have, okay, you have two species competing for a resource that's in short supply, you're gonna get competition. 
Look at what's happening in, in oil. When, you know, right now people say there's, there's, the demand is greater than the supply. You have competition, it's spiking, you know. There are other reasons obviously going on. So yesterday we saw a spike of $16 per barrel. If there was lots of it, you wouldn't have seen that. Of course, there's other, other factors coming in, but just to give you, so that's what we mean by competition, okay? So that's why we fertilize. We fertilize because we think uh, to help the crop, okay, because it may not have enough nutrients, but what I'm saying, gonna argue is that you better watch how you do that because weeds are well-placed and adapted to take most of those nutrients away from your crop and you're wasting your money and feeding the weeds. So we'll, we'll talk more about that. The other thing I should mention is do not be um, surprised if the order that I'm coming this is not exactly what's in, in your notes. That sometimes happens, but a lot of the figures will be there. And if they're not, I will get you those copies because I've modified this a little bit since I, I, I printed those off. So, um, but I will base, again, most, you know, of, of the prelims and stuff on the information you have. So don't, don't worry. This is just like, for example, I'm not even sure you have this. I just want to show you the, where competition fits in. Some of you might have seen this in basic biology or ecology. All these different interactions between uh, organisms. The ones we're going to focus in on are competition, okay? And what that means is when you have competition, what this means is basically if species A and species B do not compete, okay, let's say they were competing, you wouldn't have, the zero just means there's no effect on either one, okay? They're not competing, one's living its life, the other's living its life. They might be competing with other plants, but the two of them together are, you know, separate, don't, there's no effect. However, when competition is occurring, i.e. A and B are going for the same resource, now you're gonna have competition occurring, and usually you'll get one of the species that's gonna win out, okay? This is uh, known as the competitive exclusion principle. When you're competing, you're gonna, typically that's what happens, it's almost like survival of the fittest. Somebody's gonna get the majority of the resources, and we'll talk more about that, okay? Because it, it's got some important implications, okay? So competition, when it's on, I, here I'm showing it as, as a, a negative, negative effect, i.e. both are affected, but I can tell you that in competition, when that occurs, there's somebody wins out, okay? There's some cost even to the species that wins out because they've got to put resources to try to pick up the nutrients. But what I'm getting at here is, is that this could also be positive or positive for one of the, of the competing species. Um, when I saw this initially, I thought, oh, no, this isn't, this isn't it. Does anybody know what a mensalism is? What that refers to? What kind of interaction that would be? So what it's saying is that when the two species, when this interaction is not occurring, when it's off, the two species are unaffected. There's no problem. But when you get this on, one species is unaffected, but the other is negatively impacted. Is that like a little pathy? A little pathy is a good example. One of the species is definitely, you know, if you're the one that's receiving, that's going to receive the, the, you know, the chemical that's going to inhibit your growth and so forth, you're not going to do as well as if, the, if this guy wasn't around. In terms of, in, this could be a zero or plus in my, in my estimation, because basically you're, you're not affected, but if the, your neighbor is being killed, you're probably going to pick up more of the nutrients. So eventually you'll be favored, okay? But certainly when you're releasing chemicals, very, there's very few situations where it actually inhibits your own growth. Autoallelopathy, that can happen, but it doesn't, you know, doesn't happen that much, okay? So that's what this is. And of course, predation, what that means is basically, this is, think of this as being a herbivore and, and, a, and a favorite plant, okay? If the system, if you don't have any predation going on, the plant, nothing happens to it, it's doing well, but what happens to the predator, the herbivore? If there's no interaction, it, it's not doing well because it needs food. It needs to eat the plant. That's what the negative is showing. What happens when now you do get parasitism or predation? Well, the predator is getting food or the herbivore, okay? But the one that's being fed upon is not doing as well, okay? So that's what I was just trying to show you, these different interactions, okay? Just if some of you are aware of them. But obviously, we're going to focus on competition. And as I mentioned, one of these should probably be a plus. That's often the case. It's not, it's not that often that both don't do as well. It can happen, okay? Both don't do as well. Yes, Megan? Yeah, it would, um, it would be in this case, okay? So daughter, 
or cascuta or striga, witch weed, not witch grass, witch weed, which is a, a parasitic weed, okay? If the interaction, if it doesn't have a host plant, this is, this is the witchery. It's going to be, it's gone. It needs to have something that it's going to parasitize. And if it's the other species, it doesn't do anything. If it's on, then the, the daughter or the witch weed is going to benefit to the detriment of the host plant. Okay, and the host plants look bad. I mean, remember, these things are non-photosynthetic. They draw all the nutrients away. So that is, you know, parasitism. Not a good thing for the, the plant that's being parasitized. Okay? So, yeah, that would definitely be the example for daughter. Okay? We do have plants that are in that category. Okay. You don't have this, but what I want you, and you do have this in your notes. Okay? I want to emphasize something called competitive effect and competitive response. Okay? And what I want you to get out of this is, um, so let's say a species is very competitive, okay? When we say that weed, oh, ragweed is very competitive. In your minds, what does that mean? And let's say it's competitive for light or for nutrients. In your minds, what does that mean? If we say ragweed is very competitive relative to corn or soybeans or you name it, or an invasive plant relative to your rare endangered species. What is that in your mind? What is it telling you? What is this, this weed doing? Rob? Well, in a situation where it's put up against another plant and it does better and more situations like it's better uptake in this relative to the Okay, okay. So Rob has just defined one component of what we call competitive ability. Okay? So what I'm getting at is when you hear people say competitive, okay, this is comprised competitive of a given plant. The competitive is, com is comprised of what we refer, refer to as competitive effect plus competitive response, okay? Rob just described this part this component, which is basically how well does a plant do in capturing resources and making sure they're unavailable to its neighbor or to its, you know, other vegetation, okay? That's competitive effect. It's one component of what we call competitive ability. What's the competitive ability of this plant? What do you think the competitive response? What is this other half of, of this competitive ability? What do you think that refers to? Yes, Steve. Okay, I would still, yeah, and that's, that's what really happens. I mean, and I know where you, why you're saying that. Um, but it's not exactly what we mean by response, although that, that's exactly what happens. It occupies more space. But I'm looking for something else. When a, when a plant, even in like a drought situation or a more um, uh, like flood situation or something, and that, those extremes, it surpasses it. It actually will do continue to do well even in situations where there's low resources. That's it. Okay. Rob, do you remember these lectures from last, last year? Competitive response is how well does a plant do when there is a resource that's in short supply? So the first one, the effect is how well does it capture the resource and takes it away? This is how well does it handle? If somebody should take away resource, how well does it handle the drought? the low nutrients, the high compactness, okay? And we call that the competitive response. The analogy that I've used in the past that seems to stick with the students, with people, and is think about a boxing match, okay? And you could be world champion, you know, heavyweight, by having the really strong competitive effect, i.e., you, you give the punches, you're on the offense. You become world champion because you can dish it out. But you could also be a world champion by being really good at taking hits. I mean, at some point, you have to give some. You can't just win by being on defense. But what this is, this is the defense part. How well can you handle the punches? Are you knocked out as soon as one punch comes? That's how well do you do in stressful situations, okay? Some species do, are really good at this, some generally good at this, and somewhat okay in that, and you could still be very competitive. 
The species that can do both are really top-notch species. Most of our invasive plants, okay, tend to be this. Swallowwort that I work with is one of a great example. It is definitely fast growing. It's a vine. It can capture resources, but it also tolerates shade. It can sit there where most species can't handle. You either like shade or you don't, but here you have a plant that can do both. So the competitive ability of, of pale swallowwort okay, is very hard because it has both a strong competitive effect but also a strong competitive response. Okay? So a boxer on the offense, a boxer on the defense, you get both, you're going to be in trouble. Okay? So think of that when you're kind of trying to think of it. Wow, you know, why is this weed there? That's ah, because nothing else can grow along roadsides. None of our crops, you can't put tomatoes along the roadway, but boy, there's a lot of ragweed there. And there are a lot of other species that are there. So that's something to think about. So if ever you're you know, what is the competitive ability of this plant? Think about, try to figure out what is, and you know, the trick is, of course, how do you measure this? You know, so how do you determine what is the competitive response? And you can actually do some experiments by, you know, lowering water, moisture availability, and nutrients, seeing how well the plant can tolerate. So this is more like a tolerance. And this is a, you know, more of what we call competition. Yes? When you talk about competitive ability, is that like a, it's not a quantitative thing, right? It's just a kind of a... It's, it's a, a general level. term. I didn't know if you had like a scale or something. Like right. I mean, we, we can include some species because not all species compete on, you know, what's, it, it'll depend on what resource is being competed for. Some might be really good at taking up nutrients. So, for example, a good example would be uh, pigweed. Excellent at taking up nitrogen. Now, I'll show you some, some reasons why pigweed can be poisonous to your, your animals. Because it stores nitrogen, nitrates, in high levels, and that could be poisonous when, when, when an animal eats them in you know, high level. Common purslane, for example, very good competitor for water. Doesn't need much water. It's a C3, a C4 camp plant. It's almost like one of those desert plants, and I'll show you. Doesn't need much water, but it's in drought situations, it takes it away from your crop, which requires a lot. So, to answer your question, no, there isn't a value that we put. It's more conceptually, this is what we're meaning, but people were trying to measure. But it'll vary if you're looking at fertility, water. Uh, some of them, you know, are, are impacted in different ways by these, these nutrients. So I wish, but I can, we can rate some species as being, you know, very high, having high competitive ability when we include all these factors. But there's no one less. Is it usually, when, when you talk about that, is it usually referring to, um, you know, in relation to a certain source, or is it a general overview of that fit? It's, it's, in certain cases, it is a broad. We just say this plant has high you know, competitive ability, but in some cases, we'll be specific. You will see that they were, they're talking about nutrient uptake. And I'll go through each of the main factors competed for, and you can kind of, oh, I wonder if this plant shows here more of a competitive response rather than effect. Um, anytime you have limiting factors, and, and you can handle it, you probably have some competitive response. Species like, like for example, as soon as you stop fertilizing our, you know, our tomatoes and so forth or any of our crops, they don't do very well. And, and that tells you that they don't have much of a competitive response. Some are, are quite competitive in terms of trying to get leaves out and so forth, but in general, competitive ability has been bred out of most of our cultivated crops, whereas weeds, that's not the case. Okay? But, Again, what makes them problematic weeds is that, the, that there's this. So let's see as we go through the examples that maybe some of you can kind of see, oh, yeah, I could see this more as a better effect. But often it's also used just generally speaking when we, we talk about it. Just keep that in mind. You know, what is this? Is this really good at defense or is it really good at giving out the punches? That's how I kind of look at it. Okay? Megan, did you have a question? Okay. So, um, and the other thing, what, what this is referring to, does anybody know what symmetric versus asymmetric competition is? And again, you'll, you'll have to. Competing against multiple <coughs> other competitors, and maybe it competes. If, if it competes equally well against both of them, that's symmetric. Okay. But if it does very well against one, but not so well competing against the other, that's asymmetric. Right. So, so asymmetric competition means basically that, that basically one species, in this case, is, in our case, probably weeds, are going to do much better against our crop on other species. If you put out a certain, you know, level of nutrients or fertility, it, they're not going to be, if you've got a weed and you've got the crop there or you're in a turf system and you're fertilizing, 
you don't have symmetric computation. Symmetric computation means they basically separate out the nutrients equally. Here you get half, I get half. Doesn't happen. Asymmetric. Your nutrients, usually your weeds are going to take the vast majority of those nutrients. Because of better you know, nutrient use efficiency, just better ability to grow and, and capture those resources. They do have this much stronger competitive effect. So what you tend to get is asymmetric competition. Okay? Basically going to one side, nutrients going to one plant over the other, even if they may be the same size. Okay? So that's so it's asymmetric. It's not nicely divided. Okay? Something is symmetric, you split them in half, everybody looks the same. Okay? That does not happen. Okay? In in weeds. And that's what why that's a problem for us in terms of agriculture is how do we do, how do we get the nutrients to the crop? We know the crop's gonna need it, but if we got these weeds there, unless you, you clean out the weeds. Okay? So what do plants okay compete for? Whether they're weeds or not, these are the main factors, okay? And we'll go through each. I'll give you some examples. Okay? Um, but let's talk about a couple that I'm not gonna say much about and I just want you to be aware, okay? Um, typically speaking Plants do not compete, generally speaking, okay, there are exceptions, for CO2 or space, okay? Now, you might argue, geez, they're, you know, how could you say they're not, you know, you know, competing for space? That's the one thing they want to do is, you know, get nutrients and occupy an area, okay? That's, space occupation is an indirect effect of usually nutrients, water, or light, okay? So they don't specifically say, I, I need to occupy that space. I want to get the nutrients. I want to get the water and explore and take over. Okay, so that's why I'm saying that, that it's, it's rarely they'll do it for space, but this is an indirect effect, is that they will occupy space by growing, being better competitors. Okay, uh, CO2 competition can occur in, 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 um, in dense canopies, and the C4 pathways, species that have C4, and I do have included a list there for you, if you're wondering, you know, what crops, what weeds are C3, C4, I have a nice list there for you that gives you some examples, okay? I'm not going to ask you to regurgitate them back. Just be aware of what are typical C4 plants, what weeds and crops, what are C3s and C4. Most of our crops are C3s. Many of our weeds are C4. We have a lot of C3 weeds, but many are C C4 as well. We have relatively few crops in this area, at least that we grow, that are C4s, apart from corn. Some millet, you know, we don't grow sugar cane. Those are the examples, okay? But they tend to, to be more competitive, okay, for CO2 under dense canopies. Does anybody know why? Why would, you know, I'm saying CO2 is generally not competed for, but in, under dense canopies, and usually this in the tropical rainforest is kind of important, okay, you get this. You will get competition for CO2, and I'm saying that C4 species that have the C4 pathway tend to be the more competitive, i.e. They, they have an advantage over C3s. Does anybody know why? What happens under dense canopy in, in terms of CO2 concentration? Slower. It's slower. I mean, it's blocked from, you know, just there's, there's much more of a physical barrier. And so when CO2 levels go down, which had been happening, that's why C4s came. C4s are much better and more efficient at fixing, you know, carbon, okay, then C3s, we talked about that. The Krantz anatomy, remember that? We talked in this Bisco versus Hep, okay? Again, do a quick review of plant fizz just in photosynthesis just to get you back. But that's, that's what, what, what we're talking about. Again, I won't spend much time talking about CO2, but this is going to be an important issue with climate change occurring. And we could spend a whole, you know, one or two lectures just on this. But generally speaking, under our current conditions, that's not an issue. Uh, it is not, these are the three main factors competed for. There is space, okay, you could get competition below ground for space. The roots are trying to, you know, get in there, but that's usually not, not a big, as big an issue. In oxygen, there's plenty of oxygen, generally speaking, unless you're in anaerobic conditions. Most of the time, well, then all plants don't do well. But oxygen is an important issue when you're looking at, germ at the germination, you know, getting the seeds to germinate, which I'm not going to focus on, but I just didn't want to dismiss, well, oxygen is not important. It's, there are situations, but really the key ones are this, light, water, and nutrients. And I'm sure Stephanie covered light a little bit in terms of the phytochrome and what stimulates germination, okay, and dormancy and so forth. So I'll, I'll say a little more about that, okay? Yes. Their, with a broad 
on me, then in ad say it's interfering and it's choking off and it is competing for space because if it if it can block out that turf, then then it rules. Right. No. And 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 uh, I would I would also argue that that is an indirect response to for light. A, a light competition response. Indirectly, that's exactly the reason. That turf under there is just not, you're going to get this, you know, circle yeah, of death, I call it. Yeah, the rosette. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying. I, I don't, you know, I didn't want to, and, and I mentioned this, I didn't want to, you know, give you the impression that space is not everywhere, because ultimately that's what everybody, well, these plants are trying to do. But it's an indirect effect, it's a response to light, the light response. I'm going to put foliage as much as possible, yes, of course. In, and I would say you could argue that that's really what they're doing. It's trying to get space. So, but in terms of measuring that, what really is, it's a response to light in many cases. Okay? It's, that's a response, putting out as much foliage as you can. Okay? And, the, and that becomes important when we're think, thinking about intercropping, row spacing for managing weeds. And so all this is going to come through when we start, start talking about management. And what you need to do when you've got a 30-inch row for corn, and your corn is taking, you know, four weeks to even start getting some foliage over there, that is trouble. Okay, so that's, that's what we'll talk about. And so, in a sense, Rob's right. That it, you know, they're trying to occupy space, make sure that, you know, the crop tries to overtake the weeds that are going to be between the rows. Okay? But, um, okay, so competition for light is extremely important. This is where, you know, light is going to be a limiting resource. There's no question about that. Okay? And generally speaking, okay, um, so the, the, the species that is able to put that foliage out first will be at a competitive advantage. There's no question about it. You've got carrots and onions, or you're just establishing your turf, and it's taking time, your weeds are going to, anybody who's tried to establish alfalfa, first year alfalfa, tell me what that alfalfa looks like if you don't go in there and spray. You're not going to have much alfalfa, because alfalfa is slow growing, okay? If you don't control those annuals and biannuals, you're going to be in trouble. Same with turf, okay, establishing. Just because of relative, because weeds are fast germinating and establishing. And, and so plants that start growing early tend to be the more competitive for light. There's no question, okay? Uh, these things that stay green over the, the winter and are the first things to come out, uh, how could they not be at a competitive advantage, okay? Plants that develop large leaf areas. Okay, so when we have these wimpish crops that, you know, little thin leaves and so forth, that is not going to help us. You know, so again, we need to work with, the, with plant breeders to put in traits that are important also for competitive ability. Okay, and that doesn't always happen. Okay, plants that grow tall will be competitive for light. Velvet leaf is a good example. You have all seen it. We'll see it again today. But in Stephanie's, you know, research plots, you see this, you know, velvet leaf with no leaves along the whole stem. And then right at the top, like an umbrella, it's got this, it's covering and shading out the weeds. That's a species that competes. No use having foliage where it's not really going to be needed. Okay? So that's a species. And one thing that you may, may not know is that velvet leaf will turn and it follows sunlight. It actually, the leaves will turn in, in their angle and, and always try to be almost a direct, okay, um, a direct hit from sunlight almost like 90 degrees, okay? Just like some of these plants you've seen up in the, if you've read about or heard or been there in the, in the Arctic, subarctic, you've got these plants that actually follow the sunlight. They're like radars, and you, you actually, t you know, take pictures of it at different times, and you'll see that the plants, just like in your house, you've seen the plants, phototropism, they move towards the light to maximize light capture. A lot of these species that are competitive, even a lot of our weeds can do that, okay? They have that, that trait. The other generality is that in general, broadleaf weeds are more competitive for light than grasses. And that has to do with, with leaf architecture. Many of our grasses have narrow leaves. They're pointing upward. That's not the best way to, to intercept light. It's those plants that have horizontally oriented leaves, the alternate or opposite leaves or world leaves that are, you know, basically sun sponges. Okay? So that's a general, general term. Okay? So... Don't want to minimize light, and, and Stephanie did cover how important light quality is. Not just quantity, but light quality in terms of germination. Remember the, the far red to red ratio? You should all have, that should have, if you don't know what that is, you should double check, because that's an important concept, okay? Who doesn't know what, how light quality, if I were to ask you in the prelim, tell me a little bit about how, why, you know, 
light quality is important. Quantity is important, but light quality for, um, for weeds in terms of their life cycle. Would you be able to say a little bit about how important that is and how you could use that to better manage weeds in an agronomic system, say, or even a natural system? Be able to you know, do some, some of those gymnastics in your mind in terms of being able to explain it to me, okay? Because that's an important concept. That is, that is a critical one, okay? Can somebody tell us? Megan wants to know. Can somebody tell me? If I were to ask you in your own words, and I don't need fancy, you know, jargon, just in your own words. Uh, far red inhibits germination, red uh, stimulates germination, and a plant canopy will block 90% uh, of, uh, of the red. So the lower, the lower plants will, will not receive any red, so they can't germinate. So. If your field crop is late germinating, it's going to be blocked in your weeds. But like you said, whoever's first. Right. Takes off. So, so if I've got a crop in this agronomic scenario, I've got corn, I've got a really slow growing variety, or I've got vegetables, or I've got some rare plants that I'm trying to uh, reestablish in, in a restoration site in natural areas. Very slow growing. And the sun is getting right through. It's hitting the soil directly, and there are weed seeds in that soil. What is that going to mean in terms of the you know, red to far red ratio? Are we, is that a condition that would stimulate germination or not? It would. Again, as, as light penetrates through foliage, the, as Rob mentioned, okay, the, uh, you will get the, the red wavelength being filtered, being absorbed, letting through the far red. And that's what seeds in the phytochrome can detect that. And that tells them that there's basically nothing, you know, there is vegetation above them. It don't germinate. But if they're getting, you know, the far red to red ratio is, is you know, is, is, or the red to far red ratio is relatively high. I mean, things, the whole wavelength's getting through. All wavelengths are getting through. Plants detect that. They say, hey, there's nothing above us. Nothing's filtering light out. This is a condition for us to germinate. Okay? And that's extremely important in agriculture, in trying to make sure you don't get, stimulate germination in your system. Okay? Unless you're trying to uh, basically stimulate germination so you can go in and create what's called a stale seed bed and knock these weeds out before you actually plant. Okay? So very, very, very important that that's the case. Okay. Yes, Ron. That's also a factor in flower, flowering. How long they plant. Right. And it's even key if there's a wind. When to set flower. If, if you, we'll, see, we'll see today. You're going to see some lamb scores and pigweeds that are this high. Okay? This high. And they've set flower and they're seeding. Because they are detecting the decreasing daylight. You know, photo period flowering. They're picking all this up. So length, quality, all they all basically integrate this as a way to say, hey, fall is coming, winter's coming, it's time. And so they're not gonna grow like the plants that germinated in May or June. They're gonna be this tall. They're these guys, and those cause problems, those seeds are viable. Okay? And, and that's going to be, that's an issue that we'll, we'll talk about. How do you manage that? Okay? Now, in terms of water, water is an extremely important. Okay? It does vary. Okay? It's, it's a, it's, the extreme situation is when we go through drought, some species are better able to tolerate it. Okay? But different weed species, different crop species have what we call different water use efficiencies. Some species don't need a lot of water to do well i.e. common purslane. Others need a ton of water, like ragweed, okay? And if they're taking it, they're taking it away from your crop. Now, if you're in an irrigated system, usually water's not going to be a problem. Where you've, what kind of resource would be most competed for? Let's talk about some of our vegetable production systems where we irrigate and we fertilize, okay? What, do you, what resource that we've, you think would be most competed for under those conditions? Light, because you I mean you're providing the supply. Remember, competition won't happen if you're providing enough of a supply. It's costing you, okay? But when we're in field crops, where most of our field crops are not irrigated, so we go through a drought, okay, and you've got weeds in there, it's going to be water competition. It's going to usually we'll fertilize. That's not going to be an issue, okay? Not all, often, but we can. But definitely light and water become an issue, okay? And the two interact. So... Different species have different water efficiency use, okay? You, I'm, not, I'm not sure that you have the exact copy of this, okay, 
uh, of this slide. I can, make, I can make a copy for you if you really want to have this. But the key here is, and I'm not going to ask you to tell me the exact number, but what I want to show you, what these numbers mean, is basically the number of grams of water that each of these weed species requires to produce one gram of dry weight, of biomass. Okay? Now the weeds are, are, you know, built equally. So here's common purslane, Portulaca oleracea. Who doesn't know what this plant is? We haven't gotten to it yet. We'll see it today, okay, if you're not familiar. It only requires 280 grams, wat, uh, grams of water to produce one gram of plant dry weight. You know, this plant occurs often, I'll see it in corn, in silage and, and grain corn. And I have growers saying, I'm not worried about it. It's not a big deal. And the reason they're saying that is why? What do you think they're saying this? Because it's not that big. It's, it's, it's right. It's prostrate. It grows on the ground. It forms these big mats. And the growers, uh, they need to see velvet leaf or they need to see Johnson grass or barnyard that's overtopping their corn to kind of think. And I always tell them, in a drought year, this is the plant that's going to kill you. And the reason that is is that this plant doesn't need much water, okay, to get one gram of dry weight and these plants start, the bigger they get, the more they're gonna draw, okay? Whereas your corn is gonna need a lot more, okay? It's not bad, remember this is a C4 species, right? So it's very efficient at water use, okay? But it's not as efficient as, as common purslane. And so I usually tell the growers, you better watch that, you know, don't be, you know, mistaken by thinking I don't see it so it's out of, out of sight. In a drought year, you know, you know, where we have lots of water or we're irrigating, it's not an issue particularly in our, in, our, in our vegetable production systems. But look at uh, ragweed. You need 912. Boy, does it take up water. It's a water soaker. So if water is limiting and this thing can grow, so you got ragweed and corn, you're in trouble as well. Because this thing is, is basically, and it's much better at using, uh, not the efficiency, it's just good at drawing water. Okay, it's not very efficient. It's actually taking, it needs a hell of a lot to form one gram. But what I'm saying is it's, really good at taking it away from your crop. So ragweed, either you know, giant ragweed or common ragweed in any of your crops is disastrous because of this, okay, this factor. And, and here's smooth brome and so forth. So the take home message here is that all, not all weeds have the same requirements for water or use water as efficiently as other species. Okay? And so understanding that will tell you, hmm, geez, I got a combination of ragweed and, and common purslane in corn, I'm going to be in trouble if it's a drought year, okay? Uh, because those, those guys are going to take it away from me. Uh, this is just showing, you, again, I'm, don't be concerned if, if you have it or don't have it. I just wanted to show you here uh, is, is the growth of the roots. Where do the plants, these weeds, draw water from if they're in the middle of a row? So distance from the weed row is zero. So let's say your weed is here, okay? This is kosher. It's related to lamb squatters. But let's take an example of a crabgrass that most of you are digitary sanguinalis. Let's just say here. Okay? So this is the weed row. They actually planted the weeds in a row and then looked at water. Okay? Distance from the weed, they were looking at root moisture. How well do these plants extract water from different distances away from the row and depth-wise? So how deep do these guys go? Do they go deep to go get that water? And how far laterally, horizontally, are they going? And this is, so what this is showing for, for crabgrass here is that crabgrass can go down five feet, okay? I think this is depth in feet, okay? So a mature plant can go down. Laterally, it can go, and this is the, the over three pounds per foot, this is, this is per foot cube, that's how much water. So the darker the color, the more water it's extracting. So if it's, these weeds are taking it away from your crop, okay, remember that. In this case, they didn't have the crop there, but they're just saying, should I be worried if my crop is just next to this thing? It's, you know, maybe a half a foot. How much water should I be? So what this is showing is it's got some tremendous depth, probably one of the better ones in terms of going deep, but very close to the, the plant, okay? And as you move away, no more than, what, four feet away on either side, it really drops off. So the problem, it's is about two feet, so here's, if you have a crabgrass, two feet on one side, two feet on the other side, you're in trouble. I mean, it's gonna extract most of the moisture and five feet down. I mean, we have soils that don't even go five feet, let alone. So this thing is bad. 
That's what it's saying. You have other species that basically, you know, focus really close. This thing can go to three feet, but, okay, and can move on either side, but it's very shallow. So depending on the crops, we want our crops to go in and, and go get water as deep as possible. Practically speaking, for those of you in the turf, in turf, why do we tell folks not to water lightly? What do we say? I'd rather have one good soaking, you know, a couple of inches or an inch once a week that soaks in and goes deep to basically allow your turf roots to go really deep. Not to have them on, on, you know, shallow because by light watering, frequent watering but very light watering, you're just stimulating growth of roots along the surface. And most of these weeds can do very well on the surface. That's where the weed seeds are, that's where they are. Okay? It's the same for your crop. Okay? Now, you do have some tough guys. I mean, crab here, okay, is going to be tough. I mean, it's got a lot of these weeds can go deep. Okay? So, this is not, you know, just root architecture is telling us this. This is what, you know, and I would say that this is very true for our fertilizers as well. That is why, what do we do with fertilizer? If we don't want to just broadcast fertilizer, what do we try to do to take advantage or, under, or, or make sure that it doesn't go to our weeds? What do we do? We side dress nitrogen injection. We put it right close to the roots of the plant. Why feed the weeds in the interrow? We can cultivate, okay? That is what we do, or we band. We just put it right next along maybe a 15 inch swath, okay? We band. We don't just spread the, the nutrients all over the place because these guys are gonna take it fast. We know they're gonna be faster at taking it up. They have just faster growth and so, than any of our crops. You can't, you can't, the way these crops have been, you know, have been domesticated, they don't have these. So you need to take advantage of this and you need to be aware of some of these, you know, these species. I mean, this is, uh, you know, uh, in this case, this is cockleburr. I mean, look at that. It, it can go four feet on either side and can go down three feet. This is a bad weed. I've seen this in soybean. It's not fun. Your soybean do not look good if this stays in there the whole season. That's the other, the other issue. Okay. So, yes, Ron. because the root per gram of biomass is more efficient at taking it up, or is it just that it's got a more expensive root system? It's a combination of both. We have something like crabgrass, it's, it's, the efficiency is there. For the, it's, it's more the efficiency. For other species, it's a combination. The, you know, swallowwort would be a great example. Tremendous amount. The, just the numbers, the biomass itself, allows it to take up much more water. I don't think it's any more efficient at these uh, per gram unit of, of, of root biomass. It's probably not, not any more efficient than maybe our crops. But the, the amount that it can produce in a given time period relative to a crop allows it to outcompete it. But the chart you were showing us on, on, the, uh, on the grams of water per gram dry weight, that is including the, the root dry weight? Yes. Yes, in most cases, that the most as much this was this was done in, in, in relative pot treatments. So it's a good question. Is it because they're more efficient, or do they have more biomass? I am saying it's a combination of both in some cases, but in some there's most of these species are much better at, at uh, you know just using uptaking water. Okay, but there's no question that they're biomass. I mean, you compare the biomass of some of these things. Okay, that's why when we have crops or turf that really have a good root system or trees, you know, we're going to give them at least some advantage. Otherwise, it's, it's not going to happen. Okay, what I'm showing here, and again, don't worry if, if you're trying to find this. this is, I just pulled it out yesterday. Uh, but I just wanted to show you, again, that not all species compete for water, wheat species, in the same way. And what we have here is a number of wheat species, of which most of you should be familiar. Most of these are here. The only one you may not see here is sickle pot, okay? Um, and with sickle pot is in the velvet leaf family, the Malvasia. It's more of a southern wheat. And what we're seeing here is modification of competition with soybean as water becomes limiting. Okay? So when you have cockleburr competing with soybean, okay, and water starts becoming an issue, how does cockleburr react? Does it do better? Does it do worse? So because you know some of our crops can still dish it out too. I mean they're not totally wimpish. What this is saying is that as water becomes limiting and you grow the cockleburr with soybean, the cockleburr does not do as well. Competition be 
in this case, sorry, competition becomes less severe, i.e., cocklebur is being impacted negatively. It's not, you know, as water is reduced, it's also being negatively affected, i.e., competition, the soybeans are handling it. They're handling their own because cocklebur doesn't seem to do well when water is limiting. I'm just, this is just an example, okay? Not true of sickle pod. If, and I know the species is, is adapted to warm areas where there are droughts, usually droughts. Now, as water becomes limiting, this guy, competition becomes even more severe. So this is a species, if I would be in an area that's going to get drought, and this species in my, my soybean, I'd be worried about this plant because it seems to do really well as water becomes limiting, okay? For some, like Jimson weed, it can be all three. It depends on the specific situation. These are just generalities, okay? You need to look at each of the, the systems. Pigweed, so pigweed and soybeans, and it's a drought year, it's going to cause you main grief. It's going to, competition will increase. And what that means is that you're going to have significant yield reductions in your soybean if you don't take care of your, um, of your pigweed. And I know this because we've been working with velvet leaf. As m velvet leaf, if it's a drought year, corn actually can take care of it in a drought year. It doesn't do very well. It needs moisture. If there's a lot of moisture, man, it's going to wipe out your corn if, your corn, you know, if you don't get rid of this plant. There's no question about it. Poor competitor in droughty situations, but when there's plenty, and that's why in Nebraska and in some of the Midwestern states that irrigate most of their, their corn, this is their number one weed because it loves the moisture, it can do well, and it outcompetes because of light competition. It outcompetes, but it does not do well under drought conditions, okay? Again, there's, I wish I could give you just generality. They're better, but here's examples of where it's really species specific, and you need to know that. Okay, so this is showing you how important water is, okay, irrigation, okay, and what we're showing you here is if we have no irrigation, here's quackgrass, you know, remember all quackgrass, got rhizomes, it's pretty competitive, okay, here's our soybean yield, ton per acres, 1.3, when there's no quack, no irrigation, this is very common here in New York State, that's what it would be. It would be, we wouldn't have any, we hope we have a clean field, there's no, okay, no quackgrass, we don't irrigate soybean, okay? Let's say we do irrigate it, okay, but no quackgrass, in fact, our yield is pretty, almost not, there's no significant, 1.2, 1.3, not a big deal. Now, what happens if we quackgrass? We have a quackgrass infestation, and we don't water, but the quackgrass is there, look at what happens to our yield, significant yield loss. That's a significant, they don't, they're not showing it here. You go down to 0.7, okay? Now you might say, well, let's, okay, water is limiting. So what about if we provide, we irrigate, we provide more water? Could that maybe alleviate the situation? You know, more water means, remember competition occurs when there's a, lim a resource is limiting? Well, here water might be limiting. We irrigate, black grass is still there at a given density. Sure enough, that helps the soybean. It doesn't reach the, you know, the maximum, but at least it's much, it's significantly, actually that's a significant difference, 1.0. It's still not ideal, but providing more of a resource did help, okay? That's not always the case. Sometimes you'll fertilize thinking I'm going to help the, you know, provide more, there's going to be less competition, and what happens is you get asymmetric competition, the weeds take way more than they should, and you, you have greater reductions, okay? So it's not an equal deal here, okay? Again, these are just examples confirming. I'm not going to show you this. What, what I'm really, the only thing I want to show you here is, if ever any of you are interested in this, um, the, uh, the impact of providing water in a furrow, this is in California, in a furrow or sprinkler, that is not good in these kinds of systems, especially if you're, you're, you're not going to use any herbicides, okay? The more effective method, and they do this mostly in California, is they bury the drip water, right? And i.e., what they're doing is putting it right where the crop needs it, okay? You sprinkle or you put water in a furrow, that's going to your weeds. It's not going to go. And that's why, you know, this is weed biomass. Look at weed biomass without herbicides. What happens to weed in a furrow? When you provide water in a furrow, look at that. Again, don't worry about the numbers, okay? Look at that. Tremendous. This is between rows. 
okay? Look at when you bury drip irrigation, very low without herbicides. Of course, if you use herbicides, then you wipe out your weeds, you don't have to worry, but it's at a cost. So here, the biomass is very low. This is marketable yield of tomatoes, okay? In your furrow, look at that, without herbicides, significant yield reductions. Why? Because the water's right at the surface. Remember, some of those weeds have the, those roots right there. Unless you wipe out the weeds, which is what happens when you use the herbicides, okay? But if you're an organic grower and you can't do that, what are you going to do? You're going to, that's why a lot of, and I know a couple of my colleagues in California, in the Salinas Valley, that's what we, they talk about all the time, okay? Is, is this kind of irrigation. You don't just sprinkle on the soil, unless you have no weeds. You have no weeds, it's not a problem. The only risk here, of course, is sprinkler is evaporation. You know, you're, 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 you know, lands there, it's, it's 95 degrees, it's gone. Okay, so that's, that's the, the take home message here, is, is the form of irrigation is ex extremely important. Okay, so, does that give you a sense? So if, if, can somebody kind of in a few words summarize what the take home message is when it comes to water competition? What, what, you, what are you gonna take away from what I've shown you so far? I know kind of it's all come at you at once, but I mean, if you were to give me a little summary in your own minds, what are you, what's, how would you say this? It's species and specific. Okay, but is it a significant, do you think this is a significant factor that one needs to think about in, in your given system? If you're in, you know, irrigated vegetables, the form when you irrigate, how you irrigate, the kind of weed you have in there, the kind of crop, absolutely. Okay? You don't say, well, it depends on the weed and forget about it. I mean, okay, well, let's know a little more about this weed. If it's crabgrass, hmm, I'm in a turf system. Wow, you know, what should I be thinking about in terms of irrigation? And, of course, then you bring in the other fact. This is looking at weeds, but, you know, irrigation is impacting, you know, other pests, diseases particularly. Okay? So what about nutrients? Do you think we'll see the same trends for nutrients? Okay? So... In ecology, there are very few laws. This isn't physics, okay? But the, there's a couple that you absolutely should be aware of, okay? How many of you have heard of something called the law of constant final yield? Law of constant final yield, okay? So what it's saying is that for a given land resource or a given piece of land and whatever available resources, a certain biomass can grow on that area, okay? Something like the carrying capacity, right? How many deer can Tompkins County, you know, basically sustain? And afterwards, the, you know, you're going to get major, you know, you're going to get a collapse of some sort. Either the, you know, land is going to collapse or, or in terms of, you know, resources or the deer are going to start dying off. Okay? There's a, what does this law of constant final yield mean? And this is critical in agronomic systems, whether you're in vegetable production and so forth, and even for natural systems. Go ahead, uh, Ben. It means that no matter what you do, the, the, the plant biomass will be the same. Whether it's a crop or a seed. So okay. if you have a high biomass of crop, then you probably have a lower biomass of weeds. But if you have a huge biomass of weeds, then you probably have a lower biomass of weeds. Okay. That's, that's pretty well bang on. A way for you guys to remember this is, uh, right, we'll ask Joe. Joe, you do some field crops and stuff. Why do we plant corn generally at 30,000 plants per acre? Generally. I mean, who came up with that? Who, who decides that it's 30,000? I mean, where did somebody just, let's put 30, oh, I like the four inch spacing, 30 inch rows. Uh, but I mean, this is going to make you remember this law of constant. So I'm picking on you, Joe, but you think. That's the most efficient that the land can actually sustain. Okay. Well, what happens if I plant? 60,000 to my yield. Oh, the yield will go down. The yield will actually go down. But I'm planting more plants. How can I? I'm doubling the density, and, I'm, and you're telling me that the total yield, whether it's grain or, or you know, silage, it's going gonna, it's gonna, to, maybe it's going to flatten out and then maybe even dip. Why is that? I have more plants. Because I was a vegetative growth now. Okay. Competition for the resources. Okay. It's only a certain amount of light that's going to hit that acre of land, and it takes a certain amount of 
So if I were to, okay, so if I were to go back, I've got a, 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 a land area that's got 30,000 plants per acre, I've got 60,000 corn plants. And let's say we were able to go and individually pull out those plants and weigh them, or take a, you know, a measurement after a certain given amount of time. What would I be seeing in terms of individual weights from the high density, from the high density and the low density? In the low density, I'm calling the 30,000, which is the recommended yeah, process. If I'd be weighing those individually and I would have the numbers down, what would those numbers look like relative to the, the low densities? Smaller. Smaller? Yeah. A lot of them are going to be smaller. I mean, it's, it's basically what you guys are saying. So what, what this is saying, this law of constant final yield is no matter what your density eventually happens, there's going to be a, a, a carrying. Yeah, you increase your density of your corn, of your vegetables, of the number of plants that you're putting in a restoration area. Usually that's not an issue for, you know, natural systems. But y your yield is going to increase, total yield. Total yield is going to increase at a given density. You're going to reach a, a density, N, that basically you've reached carrying capacity. Okay? The land, whether it's light, water, whatever is there, and it de depends on each, that it doesn't matter if you increase your density. Okay? If you start popping 50,000, 60,000 plants, you're not going to get any more biomass because what's going to happen is you're going to have intraspecific competition or interspecific competition, but usually it's intraspecific. Okay? You're going to have a lot of plants that will be this size, whereas in the recommended rate, 30,000 plants, they're going to be, as Joe said, they're going to be reaching the maximum. That's, that's, that's been already tested agronomically for you. That's why they tell you plant at this rate. It doesn't mean that you can't go in a little higher and depending on the varieties, but that's what the agronomists have done this for you. The, the recommended rate is this point here. Why should you waste money on buying twice the seed if you're not going to get the, any, any yield advantage? So that's why they tell you plant 30,000 and not 60 because 60 is going to give you the same amount. That is known as the law of constant final yield. It's based on the carrying gap. This is how much the habitat can handle. Can you modify this by doing anything in terms of your management? What do you think? What about if I increase my fertility? Say, oh, I can get by. I'm going to increase. I'm going to double my nitrogen rate. What do you think is going to happen? That can happen, okay? But, but let's say, you know, a grower says, what do you think growers fertilize for? What are they trying to do? They're going to increase the yield, but is the general pattern going to change it? The general pattern. Joe, did you have? Well, I was going to say, you know, when you're very, very planters, you can actually plant headlands so like 26,000 seeds per acre, and then you get through, in the field, you can plant, you know, 30, 31,000 depending on the field. Right. Yeah, and you could, you're taking advantage of that, but this is, this is what happens, okay? This is when you, that's why we fertilize. I'm not saying that fertility doesn't, is not important. Yeah, when you fertilize, you know, and, and Ben's right. I mean, you don't want to go at rates that become basically toxic to the plants. But let's say, you know, we're fertilizing, increasing the rates because we think, you know, more nitrogen. Yeah, you're going to increase the total yield. There's no question. Here's, you know, N1, whatever that fertility, that base fertility, you're going to increase it to N2. Yeah, you're going to get more yield. I mean, otherwise, why were we fertilizing? But what I'm getting at is that you're not going to get any more. That general pattern is, is not going to change, okay? You're not going to start getting this thing going straight. You're not going to have a diagonal saying, wow, you know, my yield is going to be directly proportional to my density. It's not going to happen, okay? You will get a benefit by increasing, you know, your fertility. Otherwise, as I said, why do it? But the general pattern, this flattening off, is going to continue. It's not, you're not going to change it. Because there's, you're increasing the carrying capacity, in a sense, of your habitat. You're putting more fertilizer. Say that was the limiting factor. And so, yeah, they're going to, they're going to you know, for the 30,000 plants, are going to grow more, and get more biomass. But by increasing the density, that's not going to cut it. Okay? That's where I'm getting at. So f at, a, at the appropriate density, yeah, this is it. At 30,000, once you determine what the, and agronomically it's been done, that's why when, who's in the nursery industry here? Who's working greenhouses or nurseries? Remember when you buy, you know, you buy your flats of pansies and so forth? 
Do you think it's by accident that there are a certain number of them in those, in those styrofoam flats? You may not have known this, but that's, they've already done some work to show that for a given amount of time that they need to be planted before they're sold, that will allow the greatest growth of those plants, that density and that whatever carrying capacity of those flats is. That's why after, you know, you get past Memorial Day, as each week goes on, you know, the vendors get, you know, the greenhouse folks get worried because now the plants are competing for limited resources and then you start seeing actual some death, okay? So one thing that you're going to get when you get this, so this is the law of constant finding. As you increase density, okay, if you add more resources, yes, that's going to increase, but the pattern doesn't change. So what else happens if you increase densities? for a given area, you get a certain biomass, it, it, but there's another, okay, so this is the law constant final yield, there's another rule, another law. It's called the self-thinning rule, or Yoda's law. It's in your notes, don't worry about that. What happens? I've got 100 plants in those flats, okay? Pansies, uh, you name it, marigolds, and I let them go on and compete. What's gonna happen? That's right. They're, they're going to self-thin. There's going to be mortality. And it's, it actually is, you can actually calculate it, which is pretty neat. It's got a negative 1 over 2 slope, and I'll show you. So you start with 100 plants, and I'll end with this today, okay, and continue on, on Thursday. So I've got 100 plants in here. I've seen this. I did my PhD on, on density effects. You've got 100 plants, and it varies by species. Think of this. I've got 100 plants in this flat. I let them go. You've got to allow them to compete long enough. So let's say two weeks, no problem. I go back, I look at the plants are looking good. I can harvest, look at biomass. After six weeks, eight weeks, ten weeks, what starts happening is I start with 100, I'm down to 80. I'm down to 60. Okay? What happens to the... So plants are dying out. They're self-thinning. What happens to the survivors of those plants in terms of biomass and growth? They get bigger and bigger. What it's, what's actually happens is you reach a level where basically for any given you know, resource or, or carrying capacity, plants, for whatever reason, have evolved a way to basically cull themselves. And with the idea of allowing a few individuals to survive, to reproduce and keep the species going, which is, as I said, some, we have had some philosophers and sociologists. When you look, that happens in the animal world, but especially in plants. Shrubs, trees do it, okay? And it's kind of scary in the sense that you're giving up your life, and that's what we're trying to figure out. How do they determine who's going to die? Is it because one individual happens to be just genetically a little more competitive? Or what decides that, we don't know. But we know that there's the self-thinning, okay? And that by the end, you will have maybe five or six plants that have survived, but they will all have reproduced and continued the next generation of that species. But not all the 100 will survive. And again, sociologists have looked at that because of, you know, can you link this to humanity? I mean, what happens? You know, we're all, you know, trying to help everybody and, and so forth, but what this is saying is some of us have to give up to allow, one, you know, a few of the, of the survivors to kind of go ahead and, and keep the, the, the species going. So it's, it's, you know, and it is all involving survival of the fittest. We don't know who and why, you know, they're selected, but it kind of gets you thinking about that. So that is known as Yoda's Law or self-thinning rule, and I'll show you what, how that happens. So basically, the survivors get bigger, okay, as, as more. So it would be, and I don't want to say this, the equivalent of this class, there's 30, 25 folks in here, in, you know, registered in the course. Uh, obviously, I can't give attention to all of you in the same, you know, I would have to divide by 25, but let's say some of you drop the course, don't do it. Drop the course, I'm down to 10. Obviously, the attention I can give to the 10, uh, individual attention is much greater than a class of 100 um, or, or, you know, even 25. Okay, and so with the idea that that would allow you to pass the course and you do well and you move on to the next. That's, it's that. So we'll get a little more into that. But just, these are the two laws. The laws of constant final yield on self-thinning. 